Hey everyone, welcome to episode 15. I've entitled this, Making is What We Need. I really firmly believe that that is the case. And here's what's happening on the farm. It is the beginning of December um, and it's starting to be colder here. We've had mornings that have been in below, below freezing. It's been hard to go out and do chores. The water's frozen, um, not totally frozen yet, that will take more time because it's still warming up in the a in the afternoon. So the uh, the big water bins are uh, thawing out during the day, and so um, we just have to crack them open to get to let the animals have that water. Um, we just fin I just finished my last in person show of the year and last virtual show of the year. So this is a time that I always start looking forward to as a kind of a time of hibernation a little bit or cocooning for me. Um, a time when I think back over what has happened in the previous year, I start planning for the new year and um, just try to practice a lot of um, self-care around this time. I think that's really important this year as well. So I have been thinking a lot about, you know, what this world has come to with this pandemic and all the other stuff that has been around in our environment, on the news all the time, um, the anxiety. And um, I wanted to ask you, how are you feeling? How are you holding up? I know for me, um, had a lot of anxious times, especially around the whole, you know, yarn business stuff. Um, you know, how's it going to work? How are these new shows going to be? What else do I have to learn? Um, and there's a certain sense of like monotony, like every day's the same. There's nothing really that I'm looking forward to. Um, it's not like um, we can really go anywhere or do anything. Um, and so there's just kind of a routine about it all. Um, and that's, it's, that's a little bit upsetting. And then there's, of course, the fear. The fear that, you know, this unseen microscopic thing can somehow, you know, come into your, into your home into your car, onto your body, um, and, you know, basically kill you if you're not careful. And, and then there's just like, just this underlying kind of stress about, you know, things that are not the way that we expected them to be this year. Um, disappointment is so many emotions. So I'm thinking that because we are all feeling this, that one of the things that helps me, I think, is just absolutely making stuff. Um, and then just thinking about, okay, thinking about what our lives were like uh, March 10th and what our lives are like today. I know a lot of you that listen are working outside the home um, and a lot of you that listen are working um, inside of your home, or maybe you have decided to retire because you were a school teacher and you didn't want to take the risk of this back and forth, back and forth between in-person learning and hybrid learning. It's just too much. But I know in my house, everybody is working from home. Everybody is at home. Nobody really leaves home. Um, I know that I think a lot about, well, how many meals do I need to make this week? Or how many meals do I have to make today? Um, thankfully I have kind of trained my husband that he makes his own breakfast and his own lunch. Um, so at least I don't have to be, I'm not feeding a bunch of people all day long, but I know that some of you are, and that is a stress in and of itself. Um, and, and then just the the Zoom fatigue, like really, are we going to have another Zoom meeting? Um, and just just watching talking heads, whether that's, you know, through a work-related thing 
or whether it's kind of with friends. Um, it's just kind of tiring to be having the communication go that way. I know that I'm missing family. Um, my family is uh, mostly on the West Coast. I think I've told you that before. And even with Bill's family, they're in Pennsylvania. We're not going to see them. Um, um, Bill's sister lives here in Maryland. Um, we have done some social distance um, get-togethers in the summertime when the weather was nicer. And I'm hoping that uh, for Christmas we'll do a package drop-off at their house and maybe we can yell at them from the street. Um, but it, there's just nothing like you know being able to you know, sit in the same room and cook a meal together and make a craft together, um, you know, you know, laugh together at a movie or at a memory to go through um, photo albums. There's just such a loss, such a grief about that, that we are kind of, you know, if we are, if we are truly away from our family, that, um, that it's, we are alone. I know for me, I'm like, and when is my vacation? Um, I, I know that I'm going to have a vacation in March of 2022. As long as everything goes okay, knock on wood, we're still alive and well. Um, we are booked on a cruise because our, you know, our cruise was canceled last year. So we rebooked a couple years in advance, but that's an awful long time to wait. And again, just the, just like, can I go to Deep Creek or can I go to the beach or can we go skiing in the mountains? I don't ski, but it, you know, I'm inserting my, my imagination into someone else's vacation. Um, those things are hard. You know, do you trust that you'll be safe if you go and do those things? And I, I do worry a lot about my friends who live totally alone. Um, and yet, at the same time, if you are kind of in a pod with all of your children or your grown children or your grown children and your grandchildren, that in and of itself is kind of hard. And of course, just the missing, the real connection with people. Um, we've been lucky enough to be able to have some of these in-person um, open studio times. And so there has been a way to do some real connection with people that come out. Um, but it's still really pretty tough. And where are we going to find the joy? How do we find the joy that we used to have? Like, you know, not only in our daily lives, but thinking about the holidays and thinking about, um, you know, Christmas caroling or going to a midnight church service or um, going to see the, the Christmas lights different places. And yeah, some of those things we can still do because we can do them in our car and we can still be safe with that. Um, but where are we finding our joy? And I don't want to be like a total downer about this. You know, that's not the point. But the point is, is like, I think that we do have to acknowledge what we're feeling, how much has changed, and what what can we do about it? What can we do about it to keep ourselves um, sane and happy and content? So I've been thinking a lot about this, and I know that making making things, using our hands to make things, really does help us in this whole self care arena. Um, I know for me, it calms me, it soothes me. It gives me a focus. It gives me some joy, especially if it's um, something new that I'm creating totally from scratch and I can feel proud of what I've accomplished. Also, a lot of what we do in making involves like repetitive motion. For sure, knitting and crochet does. And I think quilting does in a certain way, um, especially if you're doing hand quilting. But even just sewing, piecing, you know, doing piecing on your sewing machine, there is a repetitive um, feeling for that. And um, when there is that kind of repetitive motion, 
uh, th with a series of these movements, it does allow us to kind of slow down. We slow down our heart rate. We slow down our brains a little bit. We can focus on how to make that stitch or um, that quarter inch seam allowance or making sure that you have, um, you have anchored your stitches well enough. Um, the repetitive motion of picking up each bead that you want to put onto a piece of fabric or a quilt. Um, and it helps you get into kind of the flow and kind of leave your worries behind. And while it's not, you know, knitting or crochet or beading or needle felting or wet felting, while it's not meditation in and of itself, it does kind of lead you to a meditative state. And again, it's a place where you focus, you're focusing on one thing, you're focusing on that fabric in front of you, you're focusing on those stitches you have to make, and it, you can then leave your thoughts behind, kind of leave your worries behind, and you stop your mind for a while, and that in effect is giving you some, um, some relief and some calm and getting you into that meditative kind of state. I also think that making with our hands connects our mind and our body. You know, there's that, the, the thinking about the crossover between left brain and right brain and using both of your hands to make these, um, make these items. Or if you're doing felting, you're using your upper body. Maybe you're using, you know, you're really pushing on things and, you know, getting fully into it with your body. If you're making um, pottery on the wheel, maybe you have a kick wheel. So you're using your legs and you're using your mind and you're using your hands to form the bowl or the plate or the teapot. Um, so you're doing this making really, um, it's connecting our mind and body. And the other way that it's making these connections is that with these hands, we're making something that has originated inside of our brain. It's that whole creativity part, whether you're making a garment or a doll or a, a or a cup or um, a, fig, a felted figurine or a quilt, you've thought that up in your head and then your body is carrying out the steps to, in order to make that. And so you, we're feeling that mind-body connection, which I feel sorry for people who don't have um, kind of a, a making outlet, a hobby or a vocation that is something that allows them to make and be creative in their lives. Because I think it really does, you know, give us not only pleasure, but it gives us some, some sanity. It gives us some anchoring in the world and also anchoring in our creativity in our minds. So do you have a specific time of day that you devote to making? Um, I, again, with this, with this pandemic, with these times when you have, you know, kids that are, uh, if you're doing work on the computer, your significant other is doing work on the computer, your kids are doing work on the computer, there's meals to be had, there's things to do. Do you, are you taking out time or are you making time to do something, some kind of making practice? I know that I have a specific time that I try to do this and that's kind of at the end of my day. My, when I say that it's, um, being a long time school teacher, even though I know, you know, you all know with the school teachers work so hard. My school was not done at three o'clock. My work was not done at three o'clock, but that was the time that I could kind of switch off and switch tasks. So it's still for me like that, that three o'clock time is a time where I can like switch my thinking and, and go into the making side of life. And I've been trying to, um, in, 
almost kind of plan that out that that that's when I'm going to do that. I know that I can't do something that is um, heavy thinking um, or really having to watch something um, after dinner that just doesn't um, work for me very well. Um, so that three, but that three o'clock to to five o'clock kind of time frame, um, somewhere in there, I try to get some kind of um, knitting done or quilting done or sewing done or something that is, you know, totally creative, not part of my job. And, um, and that really does kind of work for me. It allows it, it's a time because I can just switch tasks like that. It really helps me to relax into the stitching and kind of reach that, that flow state or that meditative state a little bit easier. Now we're so used to, we were so used to making with friends. Um, before all this happened, we would go to a, a quilting circle or a quilting bee, or we'd go to, you know, the local yarn store for their knit night. Um, or we were joined, we joined a guild and, you know, went to those meetings and it, it was great because we could bounce ideas off each other. We could celebrate what the, you know, the color choices or what the person is making. Um, you know, it was really a great way to have connection and also to um, celebrate each other's creativity. And again, that's one of the things that we're missing right now. Um, and I think it's one of the things that we especially need. And if you don't have this kind of outlet, you, you know, I would suggest to really kind of reach out and see if you can um, and see if you can join some kind of meeting like that. And even if you're so like done, I'm just done with Zoom, um, at least it's some way that we can have a connection with other like-minded people who are doing the same kind of things that we're doing. Um, and if you don't have a group, then, you know, shoot me an email because I'm thinking about in the new year, I'm thinking about starting uh, some kind of a stitch and bitch kind of um, evening time program, not program, but um, a kind of a Zoom meetup um, where people could share what they're making, ask questions, that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in something like that, please send me an email. The, uh, the other thing that I think is so important about making is also making for other people. Um, and this pr may be one of the biggest ways to help center us at this time. Um, there's so many people that are hurting. There's people that have lost their jobs. There's people that have lost their businesses. There's people that are facing eviction. They, and we can't fix all of that. We just don't have the power to fix that. But we could make them something. We could make them a hat. We could make scarves. We could make, um, we, we could make a little something that would brighten their day. Fingerless mitts or mittens of some sort. I have a friend who's baking rolls every week and she gives these out to, um, to food pantries so that they, somebody has a, like a freshly baked bread to go with their meal. And um, she's been doing that for, I want to say more than six months. And I think the last time I asked, she was saying something, it was, it was well over a thousand rolls a week, but I can't remember the exact number, but you know, she's using her hands, she's using her whole body and making that kneading and, um, and then giving the fruits of her labor out. And of course, there's a whole lot of charity knitting opportunities or um, crochet opportunities. There's the Red Scarf Project. There's the Linus Project for quilting, right? Um, there's all kinds of things like that. And I will put in the show notes, I will put some links for projects like that. If you're interested in, in, um, doing something like that. I know at one of our local yarn stores, um, lovely yarns, they have a hat project every year and she, they collected more than 500 hats this year. Um, so, you know, even some, maybe your local yarn store has some kind of project 
that they are are doing and collecting for. It's just a nice way to do something for somebody that you don't even know, just putting it out into the world. And I know that it makes me feel better when I can get kind of get out of my own brain and get out of my own self and get out of my own way and um, make something for somebody else. So the, here's a big one for me. Now, how do we stay motivated? Because again, the monotony, the monotony and the anxiety and the fear, this one is a really big thing for me and, you know, and avoiding burnout. Um, this year has really been hard for small business owners like me, um, especially because the work has totally changed. Before it used to be, you know, die, die, die. I would die every day. I would die every day. And then, you know, you'd pack it up for a show, you'd take it somewhere to, you know, a local yarn store for a trunk show, or you'd go to a fiber festival. You'd meet people, you'd talk to people, you'd have connections with people. And then you packed up whatever was left and you came home and you could regroup again until the next time. Um, that isn't what the, that isn't what it's about anymore. Now it's about um, virtual shows and technology and social media and um it's it there's a lot more consistent kind of work right it's not like i can just prepare for this one show it's like it's 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 the work has just totally really changed and so how do we stay motivated and again if you are somebody who is working from home um, you're probably finding this as well. You know, your your day, your work day has changed completely. Um, the good thing is, you know, you can wear your slippers. <laughs> Maybe you were wearing your pajama bottoms or some, or sweat bottoms, you know, looking nice on the top and having a party on the bottom. Um, but still, the work has totally changed. And how do you stay motivated for that? And I know for myself, um, right now I, like I need to have somebody hold me accountable. And so that's kind of what I've been doing, uh, with my Thursday lives on Facebook is, um, I've been showing whatever sweater or project that I've been working on every week. And I know that I have to show progress. So every Thursday I better have something done so that I can say, look, I made it to this next section. Um, and that's really been helping a lot. Um, maybe for you, it's having a deadline. Um, or maybe for you, it's um, breaking down things into teeny tiny steps so that you can accomplish one small thing every day. I do that a lot too. I break things into teeny tiny steps, especially if the project is like so daunting that I don't know where to start or I feel weird about it. Um, and then if it's something that I can do in like five minutes, if I'm not taking on the whole project, I'm not just going to do this little one little step. I'm still moving forward, whether that's from making something like the, the sweater that I was talking about, or whether it's, you know, some big thing like, you know, designing and and videotaping my um, e-courses that I've been giving. Just doing one little small step every single day moves you towards that goal. Um, and just that accountability and the people that show up week in and week out on, my, on that Facebook Live, they're my accountability partners. Um, so if you're finding that you want to do this, some kind of making, you want to make your first sweater, you want to make your first pair of socks, Ask somebody to be your accountability par partner. Ask me. I'll be your accountability partner. And the last thing is, well, what are you going to make this winter? Do you have any, any ideas of something that you would like to make? Do you want to learn how to make sourdough bread? That's a good project, and it's something that takes a while, right? Do you want to make a sweater? Some socks? Do you want to make your first quilt? What is it that you want that you think you want to to make to, you know, inc increase that focus, 
get into that flow and produce that calm feeling, that soothing feeling to get us through this next part of our lives. So I know that I'm going to get this sweater finished this winter. Um, I'm going to do it. Um, and I also have the shawl that I started. I might have started it a year ago. I asked you all to help me pick the colors. And I had, a, I had an idea that I really thought would be great. But I haven't found the right stitches for it. So it just totally stalled out. And it was just sitting there, you know, making fun of me. Finally, I, I have put it away so that I can't see it anymore because, you know, I was tired of it, you know, yelling at me for, you know, <laughs> not working on it. Um, so I have to decide if I'm going to like pull it all out and start all over, do a different, uh, a different shape of a shawl, um, or if I'm going to try to find its voice from where it sits now and see how I can move forward with it. But those are the two things that I hope to accomplish um, in the next few months. And I would love to know what's on your list. So if you're listening to this on my website or on iTunes or watching it on YouTube, um, leave me a comment. Tell me what you're working on. I'd love to know. And so I, this is the end of the first season of the Flying Goat Farm podcast. Um, I've really enjoyed doing this um, for the past 15 shows, the, I guess that would be 30 weeks, which is, you know, like seven and a half months. So, um, that's pretty cool. Um, and I'm going to start season two after the new year. I'm just going to take, um, a few weeks of hiatus. I'm going to regroup. Um, the next season is going to be about getting rid of stash shame um, and working on becoming the curator of your collection. I've been talking about this for a long time in my blogs um, and I'm going to do a series of podcasts about it. And if you have um, questions that you want to know about, things that I didn't answer about the farm yarns, so this, this season we talked about farm yarns, we've talked about the pandemic a couple of times, um, we've talked about substituting yarns. If you have a question, or if you're wondering about something, um, or if there's somebody that you would like me to, you know, interview, have a conversation with, again, drop me an email. Um, I'd love to be to answer your questions and and hear your thoughts of what you would like to hear me talk about or hear me talk about with another person. So until we see you again, either in person or via Zoom, happy making. <laughs>